last couple of weeks. And uh, so we will look at the next portion of this scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 32. A few weeks back, we looked at the uh, beginning of this chapter, I believe verses 1 through 4, and we said that uh, Moses, it's the song of Moses as he's writing it, I believe it's more maybe like a poem, uh, something he's maybe putting to music where the children of Israel can gather uh, their history and what God has done for them and what God's doing in them and what he'll do in the future, promises that God has made. And we see this, um, his doctrine there he's saying, and the, the doctrine of God, the teachings of God have become Moses' doctrine. Mo Moses has bought into it. Moses has seen God's goodness and has experienced the blessings of God. And so he speaks that out. He's living it out. And so he wants to pass that on to the next generation. As, as he's closing out this, this portion of the book, uh, he is passing this on. And so we see there... Uh, in those following verses, the goodness of God. God knows when we need some rain and some heavy rain. God knows when we need the dew and the little small rain. Uh, spiritually, exactly what each of us need in our lives. And so through the preaching of the Word of God, uh, we, we get what God needs. And so through our Bible reading and time spent with God, God works in and through His Word and through the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then we look at God, uh, verse number 4, that He is our rock. That we can not only go to our foundation, our faith can find the resting place, on God alone, and that He protects us. He's a refuge for us. And then last week we preached a message in verses 5 through 8, speaking of a faithful God to an unfaithful people. And so we saw the faithlessness of the people and, and their desire to go in different directions, even though God was good and God was that rock that they could trust in. And so today we want to begin in verse number 9. Uh, and I simply titled it, maybe not a simple title, it's the portion, protection, and provision of a faithful, loving God. The portion protection and provision of a faithful, loving God. And so we're going to see God in these next uh, few verses again. Uh, even though His people were unfaithful, He continues and remains to be faithful. Uh, that's who He is, and so He doesn't change based on us and our fickle hearts. And so let's read this together, starting in verse 9, Deuteronomy chapter 32. The Bible says, For the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the lot of His inheritance. He found them in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he, might, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats and with the fat of kidneys, sorry, with the fat of kidneys of wheat and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grave. So let's pray this morning we'll begin to look at this portion of scripture. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, it's been a blessing to be in your house, Lord, complete in thee. No once denied, Lord, you have provided everything that we need for salvation and for life and godliness. And I pray, Lord, that as we open up this portion of Scripture, that not only would we sing it, but that it would be a truth of our hearts and of our lives. That we would get into the Word of God, that we would depend upon it, that our lives would be based on it. And, Lord, that we would just rejoice in the fact that you have been a good God to us and you provided all we need. And, Lord, so this morning, as we look at this portion of Scripture, may our eyes be drawn to you. May our hearts and thoughts be drawn to you, and would you teach us, please, what it is that you have for us this morning. We'll give you the honor and glory, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And so as we read this, we know that uh, Moses is kind of passing along the history and what God has and is doing. Uh, and, and sort of this section is, is where God has found them. God has found them coming out of Egypt and wandering in the wilderness and, and having their own issues. Uh, God led them for 40 years in the wilderness. He's preparing their hearts and preparing them to go into the promised land. Um, and God is going to provide and meet all their needs. And so we see this as he found them in a desert land, in a waste howling wilderness. He led them and instructed them. He kept them as the apple of his eye. And so we know this is particularly history of Israel. Uh, but there is also application we can make to our lives this morning. And so, number one, we see in verse number nine, for the Lord's, uh, the Lord's portion is his people. And so, first of all, we see that the portion of the Lord, the portion is that it is his people. God chooses the people that are his, and he desires that as his portion. 
And as I thought on this, I thought, man, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the wealth in all the mines. He can take money and power and everything from the nations of the world. But what is it that God desires this morning? He desires the hearts of his people. He desires the love and desires of his people. And so he says, verse 9, the Lord's portion is his people. That is what he wants. He doesn't want the power of the world. He doesn't want all the money. He doesn't want all this other stuff. He wants his people to love him and to give them their, his heart or to give him their hearts. And I thought on it too is that he doesn't desire just the uh, as a robot that's made to obey, a machine that just does what it's told to do. He doesn't want it as a child that has a broken will and that is made to conform. He wants us to love him, 1 John 4, 19, because he first loved us. And because he loved us so much, he's a faithful God. He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for you and I so that we could receive that grace, that gift of grace by faith alone. And so God provided all that we need, and we become his portion when we place our faith and trust in him. And so Lamentations 3.24, Jeremiah says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. And so like we are his portion, as we grow to know him, as we grow to understand him, and we begin to grow in our relationship with him, he becomes our portion. He becomes our desire as well. And, and I pray that that's the desire of our hearts. I pray that's why we're here this morning. We're not just checking it off because we ought to be in church on Sunday morning. This is my one time this week and I'm done. Uh, you know, I, I have a life's been rough on me and I just need to get into church. I need to hear a good message this morning. Those are good reasons, but that's not the purpose we come to church this morning. We come to church this morning to open the word of God and to hear from God. And God says, my people, those who have given me their hearts, have accepted me through faith. That's my portion. That's what I want. I want their heart and devotion. And so God pours into us. He provides for us all that we need. And, and we see the next part of that verse. He says that Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. And again, um, this comes through, and I didn't want to get into a big uh, message on the sovereignty of God. But God chose Jacob. Why did God chose Jacob? Well, I would say that from Abraham, God chose Abraham out of all people. Why? Because Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So God says, may God made sovereign choice. God made sovereign decision. But out of obedient choice, Abraham says, yes, God, I'll follow you. Then Abraham has Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac chose to follow God and to do what was right. Ishmael went in a whole different direction. It wasn't God's choice, but there was choice and decision there. Then we see that through the 12 tribes, there was Jacob who, uh, I'm sorry, Jacob and Esau. Esau sold the birthright. Esau wanted his own thing. Jacob followed the way of the Lord. And so through not only divine choosing, not only through divine um, uh, sovereign choice, we also have obedient choice on the, on the behalf of man. And so we see here that the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. And so through all of the world, though all the world is his, he chooses his allotment. He chooses those who will, through obedience and through faith, obey his word. What's he say? They that love me will keep my commandments. Not that he comes and cranks my arm behind his back and says, Sam, you're going to do exactly what I tell you, and you're going to do it now. Does he do that? No, he loves on me. He's long suffering. He's patient. He keeps working with me. He's working in my heart. He brings tests and trials and different things. Maybe godly people in my life that draw me closer to him and point me in the direction of, of him. And so his portion, he, although the world is his, he desires my heart. He desires your heart this morning. He desires a fellowship, a relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. And he says a special and peculiar people. Uh, and as Jacob was the chosen lot because he chose to obey, so we who accept Christ by faith alone become the spiritual portion of our God. What a blessing this morning to think that God sees us as a spiritual portion, the desire of his heart, what he wants, what he says, I separate this unto me, a spiritual people, a peculiar nation, a royal priesthood. And we can go back to Exodus uh, chapter 14 or 19, I believe, uh, and see that where he calls the nation of Israel a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. He says the same thing, but then we go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and he says it about you and I in the church today. He calls us out with a special purpose. He has a desire for us that we would live differently because of what he has done in and through our lives. And so number one, we say this morning, we see the Lord's portion, the desire, what he wants out of everything is man's heart, us to give him our hearts. And I would close that thought by saying again, it's the lot by sovereign decision. 
What is the lot by our obedient choosing? Yes, God is sovereign and God makes choice, but God gives man a free will and gives us an opportunity to make the choice of whether we'll accept him or reject him. So ultimately, one day we'll stand before God Almighty and we'll have to answer for the decision we made. What will you do this morning with Christ? Will you accept him or will you reject him? Number two, we see the protection of God in verses 10 and 11. Notice that he says he found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth the broad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. And, and again, then he found him in a waste and, and, and dying land, a desert land. Um, as God found Jacob there wandering in the wilderness, he, he called him out of Egypt, he led him for 40 years, teaching and instructing and leading. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says that we would go forth into all nations, teaching them, baptizing those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, right? Salvation first, I believe in Jesus Christ, I take the word of God by faith, and I accept his simple plan of salvation. I'm then baptized to show my, uh, that I die to myself, I raise again, and I walk in new life with Christ. And I begin then a, a process of growth, a process of discipleship, just like we mentioned this morning in Philippians 3, 10 through 14. It's not a one-time thing. Paul says, I, I attempt, I try to attain my, I'm trying to apprehend that. I want to bring in a knowledge of God. But he says on the backside of that, God is also apprehending me. God wants me to be spiritual just as much as I want it this morning. And I believe, listen, Christian. I believe that if you're truly saved this morning, God puts in your heart a desire to know Him better. God puts in your heart a desire to grow spiritually. And we have to quench the Spirit. We have to turn our back on the Spirit and say no if that's not our desire this morning. Because that's what God wants for us. But as I desire to know Him more and to know Him better, He says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. As I try to apprehend a relationship of greater faith in Jesus Christ... God on the other side is drawing me to him and trying to grow my faith as well. And so it's a process. It's a mutual um, growth there that God is working on our behalf. And as we say no to, to flesh and sin and, and those types of things, and we reckon and yield, reckon ourselves dead and yield to the Holy Spirit, he gives us that ability to obey and to have victory over sin. And so in that thought is that, Matthew 28, I'm, I'm not only, it's not just about salvation, it's not just about getting in church and getting baptized, it's about a lifelong of discipleship and growing and knowing about God. And so we teach them all things from the Word of God. And so as he taught um, uh, Jacob there in the wilderness, he would have instructed him, he led him with a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. Uh, God will also lead us through the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit. God's Word and God's Spirit will never go contrary with one another. They're always going to go in line with one another. God will never lead us somewhere that the Word of God says we shouldn't go. So if you are thinking, I should go this way, I want to do this, and the Bible says no, you better stay away from it because it's not God's will. You can say all day long, you can talk yourself into it, you can rationalize it, you can talk to your friends that will say it's okay. But if it's not parallel with God's Word and His will, it's not the truth. And so be careful with that. But God's going to teach us. God's going to, to put us in a place where he can teach us. Notice that he finds him, it says, in a desert land. I think about my life. I mean, I was only five, and thank the Lord um, that I got saved as a young boy. And I got saved in vacation Bible school. I didn't experience a lot of those things. But I've lived long enough to see those who get saved later in life. I, I've lived long enough, and in my job and such, I see people that aren't saved, that are still living a life in the desert. And I think, thank the Lord. He didn't find me way out in the desert at 40 years old. Hey, the Lord, he found me at five. But you know what? Even at five years old, I was in a desert. I was in a wasteland. I had no opportunity. I had no clue that I was lost at that time. And neither does somebody else that's 30, 40 years old that is, is unsaved. And they're living a life. They're trying their best. They're doing what they can. Maybe they have some religion. Maybe they have some ideas, some philosophy. Maybe they have none of that. They're in a desert. They have no hope. They have no hope outside of Christ. And it's our job to take the gospel to them. It's our job to share Christ with them. And so in that, Matthew 16, 26 says, What should it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You understand, without Christ, it's a desert. There's absolutely no hope outside of Christ. It's right. nothing. It's barren. It's empty. And life can throw everything at once. Notice the next phrase, and this just stuck out to me as well. In a waste, let me find it one. 
in a waste and howling wilderness. You know, I, I've thought about that again. I've worked downtown for a while on the bikes, and I saw the bar scene. That drunken bar scene, that noise, the racket of the music, uh, the jumping around, the dancing, and the howling of the nightlife. It's a, it's a desert scene. It's a, it's a waste, howling wilderness out there. And these people are headlong in it. They have no understanding of God and what he's called them away from. They waste money and opportunity in that nightlife. Yet they wake up tomorrow morning no happier than they were the night before. And maybe before they go to bed, they, they're even unhappier than they went when they left that night. They've spent money. They've wasted all. And they're worse off in reality than when they started. But they'll do it all again tonight. So no, no. It's a waste, howling wilderness over and over and over again. And yet you and I will look at us and say, you're a bunch of boring Christians. I don't know about you. It's been a long time since I've been bored. It's been a long time since I've regretted some things I've done. It's been a long time since I've been unhappy with some of the decisions I've made. And, and, and I'm speaking, you know, overall in life because of making wrong decisions out partying and goofing off. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for the Christian walk because it is way more fulfilling. It is way more satisfying than anything you'll find out there in the desert, in the waste-bearing wilderness. And so God gives us huge opportunity when we come to know him. Maybe it's not the party scene. Maybe it's not the drunkenness. Maybe it's just a job and career. And I'm working hard. I'm doing everything I can. I'm providing for my family. We've got the biggest house on the block. We've got a boat. I've got brand new cars. But at the end of the day, when you lay your head down on the pillow, what is the purpose of your life? Where are you going at the end? Who are you going to leave that to? What else do you have? Maybe it's not a job and career. Maybe it's religion and morality. I think there's a lot of people sitting in church this morning. It's religion. It's about morality. It's about being good. But what does it all accomplish without Christ? God says you can amass it all. You can have the whole world. But without Christ, what can a man gain if he should lose his soul? Look at the next one. Uh, not only did he find him out there in the wilderness and in that desert place, uh, it says that he instructed him, he led him, he brought him about. And, and, and a God that not only finds us, he rescues us from that life, he begins a process of teaching me. He leads me in the direction that he wants me to go. Step by step, the Bible says, his word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. It's simple, it's easy. God leads us, God instructs us. He begins to grow us in our faith as we've already talked about this morning. And then he begins to keep me. As the apple of his eye. I think there's two thoughts in this this morning. The apple is the center. The apple is the pupil. It's maybe the seeing part of our eye. You might look at somebody and say, man, you got some pretty brown eyes, Mr. Playbook. <laughs> man, Tommy, you got some pretty blue eyes for my sister. Right? Somebody might have green tints and things like that. That's the pretty part we see. But the more important part is the part that sees and, and draws in information that we need to function in life. And God says he keeps us as the pupil. I, I was amazed. My mom would tell me all the time as a little kid, I, you know, not a little kid. I was a teenager cutting grass every day in high school, making money. You know, it was, it was, it was good. Life was good. I was working hard. And they would put me on the weed eater. I would come home absolutely filthy, grass all over my face. And my mom would say, you need to wear safety glasses. You need to wear sunglasses. And at the time, you weren't catch me dead with a hat on my head or sunglasses on my face. It just wasn't cool. Right? But I would come home and I would be amazed. I would have grass on my eyelids and everything else. But never, hardly ever, did something hit me in the eye. And not only do we have a sense when we're older than teenagers to protect our eyes, but God gives us an innate ability that small things coming towards our face, we automatically protect our eyes. And so God says, I've taken you as the most tender, as the most precious thing, the pupil of your eye, I've made you the apple of my eye, I've protected you. I've cared for you. I've, I've protected you in such a way that nothing can come to you uh, and take it, uh, harm you. And so to understand, man, that it's the tenderness and protection of God for his people. We, again, physically and innately protect our eyes. And as deeply concerned and as carefully attentive as a man may be for his eyesight, so was God for his people. And I would say so is God today for his people. God cares for you and I. God takes care of us. And I think of just my conversation with the missionary the other day, when, I, when he called me and I said, you know what, brother? The Lord knew that long before your car ever broke down that you wouldn't be here Sunday morning. God knew that. I wasn't prepared to preach this morning, but God knew that, and God would give me the message he wants for this, his people this morning. Amen. I called him back. I said, hey, brother, um, I'm going to be out of town on Wednesday night with the kids at camp, but if you would like to come and speak, um, the church would be more than glad to have you. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I, it was open, but the church I had Sunday night took Wednesday. Okay? God had a purpose and a plan in that. God's sovereignty said, you know what? I have something I want my people to hear on Sunday morning. I have something I want my people to have on, on Wednesday night. And it's not missionary Sam Thomas for me to. Maybe in the future, God will open that door. God will allow that. But I absolutely believe this morning God had purpose and plans in place long before you and I are ever made aware of it. And so the protection of God, it's precious. God knows those things. I think of times at work when I'm just headlong into my day. i got other things on my mind, but I'm doing something I should be doing that I should have all my attention and I don't. And something maybe happens and snaps me back into reality. And I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for protecting me because I was where I should have been. I was doing maybe something uh, outside of safety and stuff that I should have been doing. And God protected me. And, and you may be on the road, things like that. You ever drive and you think three miles later, you're like, oh, man, I was daydreaming. I was thinking about what I read in my Bible. I was thinking about my family. I was thinking about something else. For three miles, maybe more, I haven't been paying attention. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up, paying attention, you know, protecting me in this. So God is good, and God protects us. I think the second thought is that not only does he hold us as that most precious part, that that such a sensitive little thing in our body that means so much to us. It allows us to take in and observe. But the, a trophy of grace, uh, you know, I think of a trophy, the boys have a big football trophy in their room. And when you look at that, it's accomplishment. And I, I look at it and I say, you know what? A trophy of grace. I have not accomplished a thing in my life outside the grace of God. But I pray that when God looks at me, he says, you know what? I saved him and he's given me his full part of He's tried to serve me with his whole life. A trophy of grace. Not just salvation, but a life of service for my king. A life of service for him who calls me a child of the king. And so be a trophy of grace this morning. Understand what God has done for you. Understand the protection and provision that God gives for you. That you're a portion, his desire of his heart. And give back to him what you can. Look at the next verse with this eagle. And, and for some of you, I know this now. I absolutely love watching the eagle camps. For two or three years now, we've watched them, and I see the eagle with a little egg there, and it's being born, and here it hatches, and man, it's amazing to see it. And to think that in 2018, we have opportunity to have cameras that can focus in on that stuff. But you know, long before we ever discovered that, long before we ever started putting cameras on eagle's nest, God had put an innate ability in that eagle to take care of its young. Right. And he put in the Bible how the eagle does that so that you and I can understand an almighty God that protects you and I. So think about the eagle this morning. As he says here, the eagle there in verse number 11, stirreth up her nest. I, I believe there again, it, it's this idea that the eagle comes back to the nest at the beginning of the, uh, maybe during the mating season, and she begins to fluff in the nest. She begins to ruffle it up. She begins to get it ready to put eggs in it and to have little hatchlings living in there. She fluffs it up. She adds sticks to it. She adds more protection. She does more. And those eagle nests go from Ah, 30, 40 pounds to in a couple years, they say that they'll weigh 150, 200, 300 pounds of an eagle's nest sitting up in a tree and stuff like that. They just continue to add things to it. And so she does that, and, and God does the same thing. God begins to prepare our hearts. Maybe God prepares a ministry. God prepares a place for us. Ultimately, where's God at right now? Where's Christ at? John 14 tells us he's in heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's in heaven right now preparing a mansion, a place for you and I to live for all eternity. What a God. Way better than some eagle mom that goes up there and builds a nest. But she does it. She protects her young. And God protects us throughout life. Um, he does what we need to, to protect us and to help us to survive in this life. Notice it flutter, it says, over her young. It spreadeth abroad her wings. Now, and I think these ideas, some of them is, is she may flutter over there. Uh, she allows the small eagles to know that she's present, that she's caring for them. Uh, sometimes it's cooling them. Sometimes it's, it's, it's getting the bugs away. And other times she just puts her wings over top of them and she keeps them dry. She lets them know that I love you. Mom's here. Mom's keeping you warm. Nothing's going to happen to you, baby. And, and God takes us under his wings. Not only is he the rock that's our refuge, the Bible tells us he takes us under his wings. And he protects us. You know how you kill a baby eagle? you got to kill mom first. And God says, look, I'm never going to let anything happen to you that doesn't come through me first. I'm never going to allow something to come into your life that hasn't crossed me, and I've given it the okay. So, Christian, no matter what it is this morning, it may be breaking your heart. It may be the hardest thing in the world to go through, but you'll never go through it alone. Because right. God approved it. 
God has a purpose for it. God has a reason for it. And on the back side, when he reveals that to you, he'll say, I'm thankful. I'm better off today because I went through it with God than if that never came in my life. Amen. It's a loving God. His portion, his desire is his people. He's going to take care of us. He's going to protect us. And it's got to go through him first. So she broods over her young to provide warmth and protection. She flutters over them to provide reassurance and guidance. Instruction is constant watch care. She never um, goes away without being close enough to know what's going on at the nest. And yet God says, I will never leave you. Oh, for sake. What a God that we serve this morning. And so she spreads her wings then. She teaches them to fly. She bears them up when they're young, uh, when they're tired and weary. How many times you just you just look at it and shake your head and say, I'm, I'm fed up with it. I'm done with this Christian life. God says, sleeps under us. He gives us a song in our heart. He gives us a verse from his word. And we say, you know what? God, all yours. Let's go. I sent back into it with all my heart. And it's not me. It's God saying, come on. Come on. It's not your ministry. Why? Because when ministry becomes that way to us, it's a job. When it's ministry, it's about heart. It's about God. So never allow ministry to become a job because you'll wear out quick. Keep it ministry. And by doing that, we have to maintain fellowship with God. And he'll bear us up on eagle's wings. We can sing the song this morning, but we'll sing it. Uh, on eagle's wings, he bears us up. And so the picture that God gives us in the Bible of, of his portion, his protection, uh, nothing greater than being a child of God and to know that he cares about us and he's going to take care of us. Notice in verse number 12 then. God alone, he says, brought them out of Egypt. Uh, God alone did lead them. Again, we said with a pillar of fire, a cloud of uh, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God knows exactly what we need to get our attention and to have us follow him. And so he gives us that. There was no strange God with him. And so God alone brought them out of Egypt. They received no help from strange gods, and neither will you and I. And I believe in our lives this morning, some of the strange gods that we try to depend on are our abilities. I can do this. I got this. I just work a little bit harder. God says, you're going to fall flat on your face. You better turn on me. The, the uh, false gods of bank accounts, the false gods of smarts, the false gods of friends, and, and those types of things that we want to grab a hold of. And God says, I alone can take you through this. I alone can lead you. And so God alone proves to be our help in time of need. God had a contest with the other gods of Egypt, you remember? All the different locusts and the bugs and the flies and all that stuff. And what happened? God won. God not only destroyed the gods of Egypt, he destroyed the Egyptians as they began to chase his people through the Red Sea. God knows how to deliver and to protect. And then lastly, look at verses 13 and 14. He made them ride high in the high places of the earth, that he might, that, I'm sorry, that, that yeah, he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kind and milk of sheep and fat of lambs, and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Uh, riding high, I think the provision of God number three, nothing but the best. Nothing but the best for the child of the king. There's a lot, there's some friends. We just had a wedding, right? And people were like, oh, you watch, did you watch the wedding? Oh, you should have seen this, you should have seen that. Talking about it all day long. Hey, if that's your thing, good for you. And I'm sure it was the greatest day of their life. They had no expense spared. And you know what? Greater than that, Prince, I this morning am a child of the king. They saved this morning, you are a child of the king. And he spares no expense. Notice this, what he says. He made them ride high in the places of the earth. And my mind goes back to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me in green pastures. He leads me beside the flowing ropes. He takes care of me. And even in... The shadow of the valley and the shadow of death. I fear no evil because my shepherd is with me. His rod and his staff will protect me. I have no needs this morning. My God is a good God. My God provides the very best. Not only physically. Let's look at it physically this morning as he says here. Uh, I'm just going to kind of narrate it as we go through here. He says he made him ride high in the places of the earth. I think that there's safety in the high places. Uh, you're protected. If they've got to climb a hill. They've got to really struggle to get to you. You've got the advantage of coming down on them. So God puts them in a high place where they're protected, but also up there, the green and lush and all that's there. It's the very best. 
And then he says that he might eat the increase of the fields, and God gives the increase. We might try all we know, all the technology in the world, but yet God can cause a drought, God can cause bugs and pestilence, and God can take away the increase. But God can also bless it and give you more. Then he might eat the increase of the field. He made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Honey and oil are luxury items. Honey and oil are things that people with money enjoy. And we're spoiled in America, but there's a lot of places in the world that would give a lot to have some honey or some oil this morning. And we take it for granted. Here he's not only saying, do I give you these luxury items? But in a barren place from the rocks, I'll give you honey. From the no place, I'll give you oil. I understand God can give it to us when there's no idea how we're going to get it. I think of a little man sitting by a brook and ravens brought him food. I think of some Egyptians in the desert when man is from the desert. God can provide. God gives honey and oil. What they say, what the Egyptians say about the man? This is like angels. Right? It was good. So God is good. Notice that. He made him to suck honey out of the rock, oil out of the flinty rock, butter of pine. And, and what I read in that is <coughs> what he's talking about is the cream from the top. That butter, that fat butter. That oh man, it's so good. That's what we want. The cream. And then he says from the milk from the sheep. Um, again, I was reading in this and it says sheep her size provide more milk. It's more uh, just rich and tasty than, than from cattle. Um, and it's not the very best. And then the ransomation. You ever, I don't know, when I was growing up, there was 11 of us at home, so we never had anything that was name brand. And when I got one up and got my own job cutting grass, I got my Nikes. <laughs> name brand. And we do the same thing with boys now. And that is wear it out three months. They're not going to need that. And as they get a little bit older and, and God's provided, they've got some name brand stuff. But God says, I didn't just give you rams from the desert. I didn't give you the worst. I didn't give you the low. I gave you rams from Asia. And you can study through the Bible that those were well known. They were the best. They were the name brand. If God was going to give us them out of hand. Uh, not that, again, not that God just gives us things and prosperous and then, then he gives it to us for no reason. But the idea is that when God provides, it's the absolute very best. And then he says, with the fat of the kidney of wheat, again, it, the wheat and the, uh, as it grows, looks like a kidney. Uh, it wasn't just grainy and small. It was fat. It was, it was prosperous. And it had plenty in there. And they were going to eat good. And he says, I'll just drink the pure blood of the grape. And, and in that is, is um, let me flip the page, pure blood of the grape. It's a reference to the color. It wasn't watered down. We didn't have to add water to it so that it would last. We didn't have to water it down and, you know, hope that we had enough. God says, here, it's red. It is the best. And enjoy it because there's plenty of it. And so in that, it's without adulter all that. adulteration. It's the best. It's the purest of grape juice. And perhaps I was thinking this is the reason God chose the grape to represent his blood in the communion table. As we fellowship around his blood, it's the absolute best. It's unadulterated. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we close this morning... God is so good to us. He's provided his very best to save our souls. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It wasn't some lowly lamb. It was the very best. It was a spotless, pure Lamb of God. And God gave for you and I. And then he says, The precious blood of Jesus Christ spilled to secure your redemption and mine. It was the very best. It cost God everything he had. Jesus Christ had to leave heaven's glory, heaven's splendor, the side of God himself, humble himself and become a man. Aaron and I were talking about this earlier. He became a man so that he could be born a baby to grow and to die on the cross for your sins and mine. He gave all to give us eternal life this morning. So God held back nothing. What are you holding back this morning? Will you give God your heart? Will you ask God to save you if you're not saved this morning? Will you give him your life? Christian, if you are saved, what are you holding back? God is good. God wants your heart. God has provided. He's proved himself. What will you give back to God? Are you living for Jesus this morning? Are you growing in your relationship with him? Are you seeking and desiring to know him more? And I pray that not only this message, but I pray that our friendly verse this week will remind us all. We ought to have a desire to grow and to know him more. Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you.